There are two main types of stroke. A hemorrhagic stroke, which occurs when an artery ruptures and bleeds within the brain, and an ischemic stroke, which occurs when an artery gets blocked. Hemorrhagic strokes can be further split into two types, an intracerebral hemorrhage, which is when bleeding occurs within the cerebrum, and a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is when bleeding occurs between the pia matter and the arachnoid matter of the meninges, the inner and middle layers that wrap around the brain. We'll focus on the subarachnoid hemorrhage, which can quickly lead to death if they're left untreated. Subarachnoid hemorrhages can lead to a pool of blood under the arachnoid matter that increases the intracranial pressure and prevents more blood from flowing into the brain. Okay, let's start with the three protective layers of the brain called meninges. The inner layer of the meninges is the pia matter, the middle layer is the arachnoid matter, and the outer layer is the dura matter. Between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter is the subarachnoid space, which houses cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. CSF is a clear, watery liquid which is pumped around the spinal cord and brain, cushioning them from impact and bathing them in nutrients. This space is also where the arteries that supply the brain travel, and it is the location of the blood-brain barrier where CSF and the vascular system can exchange nutrients. The brain has a few regions. The most obvious is the cerebrum, which is divided into two cerebral hemispheres, each of which has a cortex, an outer region, divided into four lobes including the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. There are also a number of additional structures including the cerebellum, which is down below, as well as the brainstem, which connects to the spinal cord. The right cerebrum controls muscles on the left side of your body and vice versa. The frontal lobe controls movement and executive function which is our ability to make decisions. The parietal lobe processes sensory information which lets us locate exactly where we are physically and guides movement in a three-dimensional space. The temporal lobe plays a role in hearing, smell, memory, as well as visual recognition of faces and language. Finally, there is the occipital lobe which is primarily responsible for vision. The cerebellum helps with muscle coordination and balance. And finally, there's the brainstem, which plays a vital role in functions like heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, gastrointestinal function, and consciousness. The brain receives blood from the left and right internal carotid arteries, as well as the left and right vertebral arteries, which come together to form the basilar artery. The internal carotid arteries turn into the left and right middle cerebral arteries, which serve the latter portions of the frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes of the brain. Each of the internal carotid arteries also gives off branches called the anterior cerebral arteries, which serve the medial portion of the frontal and parietal lobes, and connect with one another with a short little connecting blood vessel called the anterior communicating artery. Meanwhile, the vertebral arteries and basilar arteries give off branches to supply the cerebellum and the brainstem. In addition, the basilar artery divides to become the right and left posterior cerebral artery, which mainly serves the occipital lobe and some of the temporal lobe as well as the thalamus. Finally, the internal carotid arteries each give off a branch called the posterior communicating artery, which attaches to the posterior arteries on each side. So together, the main arteries and the communicating arteries complete what is called the Circle of Willis, a ring where blood can circulate from one side to the other in case of a blockage. Three things can cause a subarachnoid hemorrhage. The first and most common cause of a subarachnoid hemorrhage is a traumatic injury, like falling in the bathtub and hitting your head. Arteries in the subarachnoid space are unsupported and can easily break. The second cause is an aneurysm, which is a blood vessel that has weak walls and starts to bulge out to about one and a half times larger than its normal diameter. The most common aneurysms in the brain are saccular cerebral aneurysms, which have a characteristic rounded shape on one side of the artery and are also called berry aneurysms. Most saccular cerebral aneurysms arise in the anterior half of the circle of Willis, whereas only a few arise in the posterior half. Some genetic disorders like Marfan syndrome can cause a defect in the connective tissues of arteries and they can also predispose individuals to having saccular aneurysms.
Aneurysms can burst open when there's an increase in intracranial pressure, like what you might feel when you're moving a large sofa into the living room. The third cause of a subarachnoid hemorrhage is an arteriovenous malformation. Normally, arteries and veins are connected by small, leaky blood vessels called capillaries. But in arteriovenous malformations, they are replaced with abnormally formed tangled blood vessels, characterized by at least one direct connection between the artery and the vein. Over time, these abnormal vessels can dilate, and since veins aren't used to dealing with high arterial pressures, they can rupture, causing a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Regardless of the cause, once there's a subarachnoid hemorrhage, blood starts spewing out from a damaged blood vessel and creates a pool of blood which increases pressure in the skull and puts direct pressure on nearby tissue cells and blood vessels. It also means that less blood is flowing downstream to the cells that need it, which leaves the downstream tissue deprived of oxygen-rich blood. Healthy tissues can die from both the direct pressure and the lack of oxygen within a few hours. Another complication is that blood vessels that are bathing in a pool of blood can start to intermittently vasoconstrict, which is called vasospasm. If the vasospasm affects arteries in the circle of Willis, it will reduce the supply of blood flow to the brain, causing further ischemic injury. Over time, blood in the subarachnoid space can irritate the meninges and cause inflammation, which leads to scarring of the surrounding tissue. The scarring tissue can obstruct the normal outflow of cerebrospinal fluid, causing that fluid to build up and that dilates the ventricles at the center of the brain and this is referred to as hydrocephalus. As the ventricles dilate, there's also increased intracranial pressure, which compresses the brain tissue. Stroke symptoms depend on the exact part of the brain that is affected. For example, an anterior or middle cerebral artery stroke can cause numbness and sudden muscle weakness. If a stroke affects the Broca's area, which is usually in the left frontal lobe, or the Wernicke's area, which is usually in the left temporal lobe, then it can cause slurred speech or difficulties understanding speech respectively. If there's a posterior cerebral artery stroke, then it can affect vision. An acronym to remember some common stroke symptoms is FAST, facial drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulties, and time. Time is obviously not a symptom, but just a reminder to get help as quickly as possible to minimize cell injury and maximize the chance of a full recovery. The classic symptoms of a subarachnoid hemorrhage is the sudden onset of a severe headache, called a thunderclap headache. It's often described as the worst headache a person has ever had. There's also something called nuchal rigidity, or neck stiffness, which is caused by the blood irritating the meninges. Occasionally, people can develop seizures and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure like vomiting, vision changes, and general confusion. The diagnosis of a subarachnoid hemorrhage is usually made with a CT or MRI scan, which usually shows blood pooling in the subarachnoid space around the damaged artery. Classically, a lumbar puncture will show red blood cells, or yellowness, from bilirubin called xanthrochromia. That's because there may be fresh blood around the spinal canal, or old blood that's being metabolized and broken down. Treatment of a subarachnoid hemorrhage typically involves emergent surgery. An artery that's bleeding can be surgically clipped to apply direct pressure to it. Alternatively, a catheter can be used to place a coil in an aneurysm, which serves as a site for clot formation, which also seals up the aneurysm. And sometimes medications like calcium channel blockers can be used to help prevent arterial vasospasm from setting in. Alright, as a quick recap. A subarachnoid hemorrhage is a pooling of blood in the subarachnoid space. It can arise due to a traumatic injury like hitting your head in the bathtub, having a pre-existing saccular aneurysm burst, or from a pre-existing arteriovenous malformation that bursts. Usually there's a sudden and severe thunderclap headache that's described as the worst headache of a person's life. Diagnosis is usually done with a CT or MRI that shows blood in the subarachnoid space and blood in a lumbar puncture. Treatment is done by surgical clipping or coiling.